Take your Bibles and turn with me to Luke chapter 7. You said, that's not Isaiah. No, it's not. I had a great time in the Word this week, and God really just blessed my heart. I'm reading uh, my New Testament and just blessed by what I read this week, and I thought that I would just share that with you. I call my uh, place where I pray and read my Bible my secret place. Uh, We've been studying a book entitled The Secret Place with our men's ministry, and uh, I read uh, in the Bible in my secret place. I talk to the Lord in my secret place. Jesus said, when you go to pray, when you pray, go into your inner room, shut the door, and pray to your Father who is (coughs) in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. So I went to the secret place this week, and I read and I prayed. And I read this story about Jesus going to have a meal with a Pharisee. And while he was there, a woman came in, a woman who the Bible refers to as an immoral woman. We don't know exactly what she had done, but she had lived in immorality. And the Bible says that she came up behind Jesus and began to weep, and her tears literally fell on his feet, and she began to wash his feet with her tears and to dry his feet with her hair. And the Pharisee, who was the owner of the house, who had invited Jesus to come to dinner, he just got all messed up. He couldn't handle it. He was trying to figure out if Jesus was the real thing. And he said, you know, if this guy was a prophet, he wouldn't let a woman like that stay at his feet. Well, Jesus told him otherwise, and then he forgave the woman. And when he forgave the woman, he spoke what I believe are the greatest words, the most beautiful words that any of us could ever hear on this earth. You know what they are? Here it is. Your sins are forgiven. Let's say it together. Your sins are forgiven. Jesus had no sin. He couldn't say our sins are forgiven. He didn't have any. He never broke one law of God. He broke the laws of man, but that doesn't count. He broke their religious laws. That doesn't mean anything. But he never broke God's laws. And so he looked at that woman and said, I see your repentance. I see your faith. I see your brokenness. I see your sincerity. Your sins are forgiven. Look there in Luke chapter 7, beginning at verse 36. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him. So Jesus went to his home, sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him, behind Jesus, at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet. She wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. Then Jesus answered his thoughts. I want to tell you, you better not think too loud around Jesus. (laughs) Simon? He said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. 
How many of you ever heard that from the Lord? Anybody? <laughs> I got something to say to you. All right. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. Then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people. 500 pieces of silver to one, 50 pieces to the other. But neither of them could repay him. So he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me any water to wash the dust off my feet. But she has washed them, that is my feet, with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the time I first came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head. But she anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. She has shown me, so she has shown me much love. But a person who has forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, let's all say this out loud, your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, Who is this man that he goes around forgiving sin? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Father, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. Lord, our rock and our redeemer, open your word that we might hear a word from you. In Jesus' name we pray. And if that's your prayer, say amen. I want to share with you four things about this text. First of all, like Jesus, we must believe in the reality of sin. Sin is real. It's not some fictitious thing that religious people invented. Sin is real. He said in verse 47 in the first part of that verse, I tell you, her sins and they are many. That's a real thing. Jesus had come to this Pharisee's home. Pharisees were the most conservative Jews of the day. They believed the scriptures. They believed the prophets. They believed that the Messiah was coming. They believed that the Lord was one God. They tried to live holy lives. Unlike the Sadducees, they believed all of the Old Testament, not just the Torah, not just the first books of the Bible, but they believed the prophets and the Psalms and the Proverbs. They believed all the Old Testament. But they also added to the Scriptures their traditions, their religious traditions. And when they did, they messed up. They we're quick to judge people like this woman who lived in sin. So when they saw that woman at the feet of Jesus, when this man saw that woman at his feet and Jesus let her touch him, I want to say this to you. If you're a sinner, best thing you can do is go touch Jesus. He won't push you away. He said, there's no way he's a man of God. There's no way he's a prophet. He couldn't know the Lord or he would know what kind of woman that is touching him. How could Jesus do such a thing? But Jesus let that immoral woman who was broken because of her sin kneel at his feet. He let her wet his feet with tears of shame and regret. He allowed her to dry his feet with her hair. He even let her kiss his feet and anoint him with perfume. 
Verse 39, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She is a sinner. Well, she was. Pharisees knew it. Jesus knew it. The woman knew it. Nobody's denying that. She was an immoral sinner. She wasn't just a sinner. She was an immoral sinner. She and everyone else recognized the reality of her sin. Jesus confronted hypocritical Pharisees on a regular basis. He talked to them about their sin. Perhaps the most classic parable he ever told in this regard is found later on in Luke chapter 18. Jesus told this story to some, these are Pharisees, who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everybody else. How many of you ever met that guy? Anybody? (laughs) I have. All right. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. The other was a despised tax collector. Now that's as far as you can get away from one another with the Jewish mindset. The Pharisee stood by himself prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I am not like other people. How'd you like to start your prayer off like that? (laughs) Whoo, Lord, I know you're glad you've got me. Man, I know you're so proud of me. I'm so proud of me. I'm sure you're proud of me too. I thank you. I'm not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector over there. And then under his breath, he said, who ripped me off last month? I fast twice a week. I give you a tenth of my income. I, 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 oh, Lord, I know you're so happy to have me. But notice that transitional conjunction. But the tax collector stood at a distance dared not even to lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh, God. Oh, God. Be merciful to me. For I am a sinner. Jesus said, Now, look, you you all know who, who got through? You want to know whose prayer God listened to? I tell you this, sinner, not the Pharisee. Return home justified, just as if I'd never sinned before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, but those who humble themselves will be exalted. Pharisee prayed often fasted two days a week, so proud of himself. But he was a hypocrite. The word hypocrite means a two-souled or literally a two-faced person. God rejected all of his pretentious prayers. His prayers were nothing more than religious show. He prayed for people to hear and see, not for God. On the other hand, that sinful tax collector prayed sincerely, beat his chest, prayed for mercy, called himself a sinner. And notice what he said. He didn't just say God. He said, oh, God. Oh, God. When's the last time you were so intense in your prayers that you didn't say, God, I come to you. No, 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 no. Stop. You've already messed up. When you come to God, one of the best ways to come is say, oh, God. That's a prayer by itself. Oh, God. Oh, God. Say it with me. Oh, God. Get the O back in your prayer. Get the O back in your life. Revere God. Respect God. Oh, God. I need you. Oh, God. I'm a sinner. Oh, God, I am broken. Oh, God, I am desperate for you. Have mercy on me. That tax collector 
knew the reality of his sin. The Pharisee didn't. How about you? You constantly looking at other people, saying, well, I'm, I'm better than him. Yeah, notice the ones you pick out, by the way, when you say that. You pick out the sorriest bunch, the one in the bunch, amen? Oh, I'm better than him. Well, everybody's better than him. When you start looking at other people and trying to compare yourself with them spiritually and say, I'm better than them, you know what? You're in a bad place with God. Do you know that you're a sinner? The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 6, all of us, say that with me, all of us are like sheep. That's not a compliment, by the way. If you've ever been around one, you understand that was not a compliment. Having strayed away, we have left God's past to follow our own. Romans 3, 23, for everyone has sinned, we all fall short of God's glorious standard. And there is a punishment for sinners. It's death, and if you die without Christ, it's hell. Ezekiel 18, 20, the person who sins is the one who will die. Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death. Read that with me. The wages of sin is death. What you earn when you spend sin is spiritual death. Separation from God. Sin is real, it is rampant, and it will ruin your life. Jesus said you've got to believe in the reality of sin. Secondly, like Jesus, we must believe in the removal of sin. I don't want to just believe in the reality of sin. I want to know how to get rid of it. I want to know how to be forgiven. I want to know how God can change my life through His Son, Jesus Christ. Look at verse 47. Jesus told the Pharisee, he'd been, he was sitting in his house, that he had forgiven and removed the sin of that immoral woman. I tell you her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. Have been forgiven. They're already gone. They're already forgiven. So she has shown me much love. Apparently, somehow, Jesus had miraculously saved this woman. No telling, if, if she was doing all of that bowing and bending and repenting on the outside. No, tell him what she was doing on the inside. And he can think your thoughts. He, he can listen to your thoughts. He knows what's going on in your mind. And I believe that she was sitting there saying, oh, Jesus, have mercy on me. And I think he was saying, it's done. I think she was already saved by the time he started talking. I tell you, her sins, and there are many, have been forgiven. They're already forgiven. She had already repented in her heart. It's a heart thing. It's not just walking an aisle. It's not just raising your hand. It's not filling out some form. No, it's a heart thing. Have you repented deep in your soul like this woman has? So she, because she's been forgiven, she's shown me much love. But a person, he could have said, but you, <laughs> who has forgiven little, shows only little love. And I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven. And then he proceeded to tell the woman the same thing. Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The Pharisee heard that, that her sins were forgiven. And the woman heard that, your sins are forgiven. Forgiven. That's the removal of sin. Have you ever had something that was painful removed? I'll be right back. Hang on. Have you ever had anything painful <laughs> that's been removed? Same response. <laughs> Y'all okay? I'm not trying to be cute. I'll preach better if you'll get into this, all right? <laughs> I was working one summer on a loading dock, and my job was to unload transport trucks. 
And most transport trucks, I didn't know this, but most transport trucks have plywood on the inside to protect from all the banging that they get with all the stuff they store in there. Now this is going to grow some of you out, so just hang on, all right? So I'm getting these big boxes out. Now I was pretty stout back then, and so I was uh, pulling them out. I was getting this box that was over by the plywood. So I didn't have gloves on. 18 years old, I'm invincible, all right? So I'm out. I run my hand down there, and a big splinter of plywood went all the way up under my fingernail. Are you enjoying this? And I literally had to snap it off. It wouldn't pull out. I've tried to pull, so I just snapped it off. About that much. I won't continue describing the pain or the sight. I will tell you this. I let go of the box. And I ran. That was a big factory. It was bigger than this room. I ran all the way through there. Steve, where are you going? I'll be right back. Steve, where are you going? I'll be right back. I had to say it about 30 times. I went to the, where the nurse's office was. And she said, what have you done? And then I showed her my finger. She said, oh my, I'll get that out. I said, no ma'am, you won't. I said, all I want is a pair of pliers. Give it to me. She said, you're going to do it? I said, I'm going to do it. I thought she was going to charge me because I didn't want to do that. So I thought, you know, I'll, I'll do this. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> I'm not submitting Blue Cross forms here today. Okay. So I got the pliers and looked the other way and pulled it out. I've never felt anything like that in my life. Don't ever want to feel like it again. You say, why are you telling us that story? Have you ever had something that was hurting you? removed? Have you ever had a sin that was hurting you removed? But I want to say this to you. You can't remove your sin. I could remove that splinter because I was an 18-year-old knuckle-headed boy. But I came to the point where I knew I couldn't remove my sin. And I, every time I go up in Weekly County, I drive by a little Baptist church that's not as big hardly as this section right here. And I pull by there every time I go. If I'm in that area preaching or just going through, I stop by that little church, cross the railroad track, right up on the right. Fellowship Missionary Baptist Church. And I remember when God removed my sin. And it was a lot worse than a splinter under your fingernail, I'll tell you that. I was, I don't even know if I should tell you this too late, I guess, but next day I was getting my ankle taped after I got saved. And I realized I hadn't said a bad word all day. I told somebody, I said, I lost a third of my vocabulary when I got saved. Amen. <laughs> and the guy was taping my ankle before we went out on practice. And I said, I hadn't said a bad word all day. He looked at me like I was from Mars. But I just knew God had saved me and forgiven me and removed that splinter out of my heart. Aren't you grateful for the grace of God? Amen. David was an immoral man like this woman. And he rejoiced when his sin was removed. I, one of my favorite Psalms is Psalm 103. Verses 10 through 12 say, he, he, God does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve. For his unfailing love toward those who fear him is as great as the height of the heavens above the earth. 
He has removed our sins. Say that with me. He has removed our sins. Keep reading. As far from us as the east is from the west. Can we just give God praise right now? Can we give him praise right now? Amen. Have you ever had your sins removed? You can today. Like Jesus, we have to believe in the removal of sin. Very quickly, like Jesus, we have to believe in the requirement for salvation. What is it? Faith. Look at verse 50. And Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Say that with me. Your faith has saved you. With all due respect, it wasn't her tears that saved her. It wasn't her perfume that saved her. It wasn't even her kneeling at Jesus' feet that saved her. It was her faith that saved her. Your faith has saved you. When Jesus talked to Nicodemus, he said, your problem is you think you can earn salvation, Nicodemus. What you need to do is believe so you can be born again. John 3, 14 and following, the Son of Man must be lifted up, Nicodemus, so that everyone who believes in him, there it is, there's faith, will have eternal life. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. God sent his Son into the world, not to judge or condemn the world, but to save the world through him. What's the requirement of salvation? Faith in Jesus Christ. You can't just have faith. You have to have, it's not just having faith. It's the object of your faith that saves you. Jesus saves you. Have you ever put your faith in him? Have you ever believed on the Lord Jesus Christ? Hebrews eleven six says it's impossible to please God without faith. Anyone who wants to come to him must believe. You must believe that God exists and that He rewards those who sincerely seek Him. Sinner, it's impossible to please God without faith. The requirement for salvation is faith. Well, Jesus, like Him, we have to believe the reality of sin, the removal of sin, the requirement of sin. But there's one more thing, the requirement for salvation. And there's one more thing, like Jesus, we have to believe the result believe in the result of salvation. What's the result? Look at verse 50. Jesus said to the woman, say this with me, go in peace. Do you realize how many people would give just about anything if they could just have peace? Peace. It's the word shalom in the Old Testament. You know what it means? It is well. Say that with me. It is well. Are you living in peace? Yes, it is well with my soul. It is well. It is well. It is well. Peace, shalom to my soul. Peace to my soul. Peace to my mind. Peace that comes from God. And she heard Jesus say, go in peace. Live your life in peace. Don't worry about people like this man here, this Pharisee. Don't listen to them. Listen to me. Remember what I say to you. Go in peace. And I tell you, when the Prince of Peace tells you to go in peace, go in peace. Go in peace. But preacher, you don't know what I've done. Go in peace. If you've repented, go in peace. If you've got peace with God, that's really all that matters. You can go in peace with God. He's forgiven you. You can go in peace with others. You can forgive those who have wronged you. And you can go in peace with yourself. You know, probably the hardest thing to do is to forgive yourself. To forgive yourself. To receive the grace of God. At home during my prayer time, I've been singing praises to the Lord, playing the guitar. I've got a 1956 Baptist hymnal. I got the old one, that's right. 
I like anything that's older than me. It's one year older than me. I still remember singing those songs between my dad and my mom. One song I sang this week, when peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. It is well. Peace, shalom. Though Satan should buffet, though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control that Christ has regarded my helpless estate and has shed his own blood for my soul. Now listen. Listen to this one. Here it is. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin not in part but the whole, has been nailed to the cross. I bear it no more. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, oh, my soul. Let's praise him right now. Amen. It is well. Jesus said in John 14, 27, I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart, and the peace that I give is a gift the world cannot give. You'll never be able to buy peace. You'll never be able to get peace through politics or through money or through things or through people. No, no, no. The peace I give is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled. Don't be afraid. I'm leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and peace of heart. That's the result of salvation. Don't you love to get around people that are saved and act like it? They're saved and they realize, I've got peace. And it's like a river. And it's flowing from my soul. I've got peace like a river. And it's flowing from my soul. Do you have that peace today? Do you have that? That's what everybody's looking for. That's what the people on Wall Street are looking for. That's what all the people that are marching in the streets are looking for. That's what all the people that are yelling mad on the television set are looking for. They don't even know it. They're just looking for some shalom. They're just looking for some it is well. And look at me. Everything doesn't have to be well for it to be well. You can be living in chaos and still say, well, yeah, that's, that's what that is, but it is well. <laughs> I'm happy in Jesus. I mean, there have been many martyrs about to go give their lives and just grinning on the way. Saying, this is not going to be a bad deal. Within a few moments, I'm going to be at the feet of Christ. You say, you've lost your mind. Sure have. Lost my mind. I gave it to him a long time ago. Do you have that peace? Let's bow just for a moment. Some of you are troubled here today. And you don't have peace. Jesus is peace. He's not just the source of peace. He is peace. He is Jehovah Shalom, the Lord our peace. And he said to this immoral woman who had repented of her sin and put her faith in Christ, go in peace. Live in the shalom of God for the rest of your life and for all eternity. Do you have that?